welcome everyone for an, to another show of Access to Perspectives. I'm here today with Matteo Tadelli, um, zooming in from Barcelona. And yeah, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure having you, Matteo. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. So like myself, also you are a consultant for academics primarily, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and in particular, those who want to transition from academia to the industry, you are also an author, just published your second book on the topic. Um, again, kudos and congratulations on that. Thanks. And yeah, so um, how we often start these conversations is please share a little bit about yourself. What's your background? What made you jump into the um, roller coaster that is entrepreneurship, <laughs> um, which is very exciting, also sometimes scary, but I think academia can feel the same way as we also both experienced. So mm -hmm. yeah, but please tell us about yourself and what turned you into, well, how how your transition went to being now a consultant for, for research. Sure, absolutely. So um, I've been in academia for like most of my career. Um, uh, I did um, in the, my PhD was uh, back in Vienna at the medical university. Um, there was a, a short one around three to four years. And then I did my first postdoc in the same institute in another lab. And after that, another postdoc uh, in uh, New York City at Cornell. So it took me a little bit of time to really understand uh, what I wanted to do as a grown up. Um, and I, I actually got stuck in academia quite a bit of time, like I think longer than I wanted possibly. Um, and I'm saying this because I think back in the days, especially as a PhD, um, you know, you don't get really a lot of guidance on uh, careers and uh, different trajectories uh, out there for your career. So, you know, mm -hmm. when I was um, kind of coming to the end of my PhD, uh, a postdoc was just a natural transition for me. And the only really thing that I was seeing, um, you know, as a possible career step for me. So. Uh, while I was uh, wrapping up my PhD, this other postdoc opportunity came about because uh, we were collaborating with another lab and yeah, they just wanted me to, um, you know, work with them. And so without thinking too much about it, I just, you know, took this opportunity and started my first postdoc. It was a couple of years, like, like it was two years of postdoc. And I think overall, it was a very nice experience because it got me to travel quite a bit. I was presenting in San Francisco as well. And that's where I, be, uh, I then met my other boss in New York City um, that really proposed me to start a um, another postdoc at Cornell. And I was like, wow, New York City, it's amazing. I really need to mm -hmm. like give it a try and uh, really try to really understand how a research is done in the US. So I think generally speaking, it was overall, like also looking back right now, it's it's been like a very cool experience. Um, but I think I got like it, it took me a little bit of uh, I got stuck in academia a bit too long, uh, I guess, because then afterwards, um, when I got to New York City, I really realized that, you know, there were other possibilities out there for me as well. So, uh, you know, I could have gone to biotech, I could have gone to uh, management consulting and other, um, you know, different trajectories for uh, PhDs um, uh, with, with my background. And I also understood on this side what kind of uh, salaries my colleagues were making in private, which was kind of, uh, you know, depressing like for double. me. Because <laughs> exactly. I was making the, the, the half of it. So it was like, wow, uh, that, that feels like, you know, it's, it's not all about money. And I really kind of appreciated the experience uh, like at Cornell. It was really amazing and really like a lot of learnings. But you know, when you face yourself with the cost of living of such a city, like, and you you receive, like, either you want it or not, you get, like, financial pressure to some extent. You really say, well, okay, wow, that's, uh, you know, my same job I performed in a, in private is just uh, paid the double for some, for some or any reason. So mm -hmm. I was getting curious about it. I started really um, attending career development courses and things that the university um, was uh, actually offering back in the days. And that was actually a great uh, thing to do because they were inviting different professionals from uh, different fields. And I really got um, a nice overview on, on what the different offerings uh, was, uh, was out there. 
-hmm. And that actually um, coincided with a um, uh, COVID pandemic. So it was a little bit, you know, of shuffle around really thinking about, you know, new directions and things. And then uh, I was learning all these things. I was doing some career coaching as well. And that got me like the motivation to write my, my first book, which is called Samuel Lip for PhDs, uh, which was really about putting together uh, this kind of knowledge that I got from here and there and really trying to uh, provide a guide to other peers and other PhDs and postdocs that were going through the same struggle to really trying to understand what the industry, what, what industry and private sectors is about after so many years in academia. Mm. And I think that got me to really understand um, and uh, got me into my first uh, transition into biotech. Uh, and um, I, I basically got a position as a senior research scientist and in, in a biotech based in Boston that also had research fa facilities in Europe. And so I got this position and um, because it felt like a reg like a very like easy and seamless transition for me because I was coming from a bench scientist uh, science background and I was gonna perform experiments at the bench again just in private. So you know the overall interview process was 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 interesting to acknowledge and it was definitely different from from uh, an interview that you get uh, for a postdoc, which is mm. At least to me, was extremely informal. While uh, you know, for to get this job in a biotech, I had like different rounds of interviews, different presentations, different meetings with different people. So it was kind of a bit of a of a journey also to get there. Mm. Uh, but um, finally, I got in um, um, this job as a senior uh, scientist in a biotech, and I think generally speaking, the job itself was very similar to what I was doing before. So when uh, PhDs really asked me, you know, what the skills you think you were missing when you transitioned to your first job in, in private? And I was like, well, it's not that you, you really have all your skills there. It's just a way of reframing them and really make, making them translatable into something that makes sense in industry. So I was doing bench work. It was a little bit, possibly a little bit more structured. So we had, we had different uh, kind of goals to reach within, uh, you know, our programs and things like that. And it was much more collaborative than uh, in academia because, as as I remember during my postdoc and PhDs, it, I was the only responsible of uh, my project really. So. Um, there was, of course, you know, you could always go to a colleague and ask uh, whether there was a project a problem with a specific technique. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, you know, it's at least to me felt like a bit of a lonely kind of it, it's less team based than uh, it would be like in private. Yeah, at least that's, that's my perspective. Yeah, totally. Can I just hold you there? Because that's I think like at least for me, there's against the assumptions what you would think it is the differences are because from the mere look at it it sounds as if academia would be so collaborative um mm -hmm. academics pride themselves of being friendly cooperative this and that but it's been become such a almost hostile environment where yeah the pressure is on you have to publish certain amounts of papers in particular journals um mm -hmm. you're left to your own destiny um, yes, you can ask colleagues, but how likely are you to ask because imposter syndrome? Like, oh, I should know this. Like, that's what I've felt right. most of the time and as a PhD student. I should know this myself. Mm -hmm. I cannot ask this. It's too trivial. <laughs> then again, like once you open your mouth and ask, people, it turns out like others also don't know. So let's figure it out together. <laughs> Whereas in the industry, like, first of all, like you mentioned the structure, there's a clear deadline. Like when a project... Um, supposed to be finalized and the client needs a product or an outcome um, then there's a reporting line and whatnot whereas in academia it's like yeah um you have three years good luck with that <laughs> and then either you you set your own deadline which hardly anybody that i certainly didn't you vaguely know okay i need to finish within whatever but then that's so difficult to work towards and so yeah, what I what I've learned also from being an entrepreneur and looking into all kinds of non-academic um work placements, also in the government or um like non-governmental institutions with the United Nations and here and there, um as boring as it sounds, desk work or also lab research um and time bound sounds or oh, there's so many strings attached, but the strings are also structure and they help making the work more efficient and they help 
in having a feeling of accomplishment every day of the week and not being left with the frustration of <laughs> that we are all know so well as academics. So I feel both sectors, like, um, or if we look at industry and academia next to each other, they can still learn so much from each other, but they tend to not know, but people in each sector don't tend to not know much about the other. And there's only vague assumptions. Like you said, like when, like, um, PhD students tend to undersell their their learnings because they don't get certificates for what they acquire as skills over the course of a PhD or a postdoc, but they have all of that team management skills, project management skills. Maybe not as much time bound <laughs> as it could be, but but they know the processes. But they some might actually take a project management course, which we also offer, but. Um, but it's not often that you get a certificate for all the skills that you acquire, or let alone in, in molecular biology, what I did, image analysis, imaging, um, uh, what is it, cell lineage analysis on the computer, um, data analysis. And then what we are being taught in academia, what we should present as skills is the list of papers that we've published. And then the Employers are supposed to read from that what skill sets we have, but that's not how it works in industry, right? Yeah, I agree. I totally agree to that. Uh, I totally agree on the fact that the teamwork as well, it's something that uh, you know, comes through a little bit more in industry as well as mentorship as well. That is something that's uh, also, in my opinion, sometimes is really uh, missing, especially when, you, when we talk about careers outside academia. Um, so... Yeah, so I think generally speaking, this transition, uh, it was an interesting one and it, it was great to to experience like another um, environment, work environment as well, that was different from academia. But when I was there, I like slowly realized that I didn't want to do bench work anymore. Mm -hmm. it, it was just, you know, I've been doing bench for 10 years uh, and, <laughs> you know, it's just it's What just was it much. that you didn't like? For me, it was the pipe and the repetitiveness. It's like I felt like a robot. Yeah, like, it's too. Yes, it's you too can repetitive. automate a lot of that, especially in the industry. There's a lot of automation, but then you deal with machines every day and and computers and what I mean, computers. Yes, it's also what I still yeah. deal, deal with, but I kind of it's more engaging and interactive. So re the repetitiveness that's very much mm -hmm. necessary in research. For sure. You know? For sure. So that that's something that I didn't enjoy anymore, and it was something that also like I I I I really appreciated the the science and the granularity of of topics, but for instance, understanding and troubleshooting why this specific Western blot was not working because my antibody was at the wrong concentration or the cell number was at the wrong concentration and things. I, I just didn't have any more patience for that to be honest. And <laughs> After ten years of lab. Yeah, I, I need to just um, highlight this fact because um, our specialty at Access to Perspective is to inform about open science practices. And with open science, one of the principles is open methodology. So there is a tendency, there's various venues where um, people can share the methodologies, also null results, negative results. Um, there's um, fora and communities where you can engage um, and, and ask a community, hey, I'm doing this experiment with the setup, um, what am I expected to see if I do this and that? So, so there are um, ways that we can dig in, but again, also here, not many researchers are aware of the services, the practical, the practices that come with open science, because when people hear nowadays open science, they immediately think open access and um, equalize that with, oh, it's expensive. But that's just one small um, reality of the whole, full spectrum of open science. So so I'm, I'm saying, so what we want to accomplish is um, to, to make that pain point break <laughs> that you just mentioned, which leads many people to leave academia or research in general. So to make research more efficient, more informative, more cooperative. Again, I think it used to be like that a um, couple of decades ago. Mm. Anyways, but yeah. Um, so there are, it's also like, I think it's common. Like I also have trajectory or turning points in my career path 
after five, seven, ten years, it's time to move on to try something right. new. There's only one lifetime to spend our time at, and why not um, try different things and what mm -hmm. we enjoy. And once a certain job or environment or country becomes too much of a routine, there's more to explore. So there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that, even if you love your job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree to that. And that really goes along with my with my career change then afterwards because I was really like, okay, well, you know, I really don't want to do bench work anymore. And I really like appreciate a more flexible work environment and uh, um, work remotely a little bit. And that's that's when this other opportunity came about. And uh, this was a company based in Chicago that uh, does life science consulting. Mm -hmm. And uh, so basically they got me there like as a full-time project manager and um, a consultant for, for them. And the cool thing was that I could really work from anywhere I wanted. So I could really travel. And that's when I really uh, left my apartment and really started um, a bit of a nomadic life in which um, I'll be traveling around Mexico. A little bit I was in uh, Los Angeles as well and then around Europe. And then I could just work whenever, you know, like according to timelines, of course, and um, and projects, uh, deadlines and things like that. But I could really be fle very flexible with that. And I think uh that was completely you know another another kind of area and another career that was extremely different from what, what i was doing before and I, I can explain a little bit about it so uh, my title was you know life science consultant and but i was doing a lot of project management and uh like clear consultant so really like kind of talking to clients and really answering their questions so Generally speaking, a client will come to us, a client that will be a corporate most likely will come to us and ask us questions of, uh, depending on, on the challenges. For instance, I don't know, they will ask us, uh, what's the next um, probiotic that is uh, very effective in uh, women after the 50s or something like that? Mm. And they will come to us and we would answer the questions in a way that makes sense. So uh, analyzing data sets such as, you know, clinical trials, or uh, uh, scientific literature that is out there, as well as uh, analyzing uh, other competitors or people or other biotechs or people influential in that specific topic. And then, uh, so I would work with a, with a set of a team of analysts that would do, would crunch the data, come back to me with a, uh, a data set that I would then kind of distill into something that is understandable to the client, to the to the client, mm -hmm. and then present it to the client in a one on one meeting. So, mm -hmm. I think there, like the skills that were like mainly like very important were really like a lot of project management skills. So really trying to understand and prioritizing uh, tasks as they come through. Uh, that was something that, as you mentioned before, I didn't really learn so well during my PhD because, as you said, like during PhD, yeah deadlines like whatever like in three years maybe you get some stuff done maybe you're not well here yeah, and also like for many people also in germany like you're even if you don't finish um within time you're expected to publish two or three papers during your phd right. in the life sciences at least and yeah. then you don't get the results for these papers and then getting those papers published is another thing but then it's it's also commonly accepted that you then continue the PhD with no payment. Like, what the heck? Who does that? Mm. Or, I mean, you can, you're can you free to find your payment. So all of these difficulties are coming back to time management. But this is, again, something we, I think also you and your consultations um, help researchers with um, and how to manage their time more towards industry standards. And that might sound scary, but it's actually helpful by setting the deadline when when do you want to finish your phd and then reverse engineering from there so that you know how you need to organize your research in a way that to actually get reliable results one way or the other mm -hmm. and to ask the right questions to your research setup mm -hmm. and to know where to find information to so all of that comes together again back to open science principles across the um workflow of research so all of that is possible so yeah okay yeah i don't mean to interrupt for so long but yeah no no no. just just yeah uh, like we said in that really project management was a skill that uh, it was important to learn and mm. i really had to learn a little bit on the fly because um yeah it, they don't teach you how to project how to project manage like five or six projects at, at the same time you know on a very tight mm. deadline so that can be stressful at times 
And also I think another uh, skill that I developed with time was really communication to different audiences. So I think there was something in academia that I didn't learn so well, uh, at least in my experience. So I would be presenting my resu results normally, you know, in lab meetings or at conferences that are normally just attended by very, um, a very special crowds. So people that they really understand the nitty gritty details of whatever you're doing. While this time I really had to explain like and make uh, a data setting understandable to someone that possibly was in marketing or business development and wasn't a scientist really. So uh, I really had to ad adapt my vocabulary in a way that was understandable to other people that you know were not in the, in the business, which was something like that I really enjoyed actually, because I don't always like to talk like necessarily always technical, uh, and it's nice to come to to have di different ways of communicating mm -hmm. with different people. But it's something that I think academia didn't really provide me, um, like and didn't really equip me very well uh, to do. So I think that's something that's another skill that's like communication to different audiences is something that I was uh, learning also as well on the go. Yeah, that's called science communication. And that's such a blurry term. But mm -hmm. if you look at it, um, there's there's like you said, there's there's different stakeholders of research in science, um, and each stakeholder has their own language. So what I also often do in my trainings is to let people do a stakeholder analysis. Who I who has a stake? Who in society has a stake in your research? Who's interested in seeing your results? And that is policymakers. Um, Farmers, if it's anything agriculture related, um, uh, yeah, the general public it, like to gain knowledge for whatever purpose, um, and then particular stakeholders, and then you can you know diversify from there, and then each of them needs to be approached in a different way, in a different language, so more formal, less formal. How can you reach them? What platforms to use? Um, do you email them directly or can you use social media to get their attention? So so all of that is science communication and also not to forget communication amongst scientists within the ivory tower. That also includes scientific writing, um, mm -hmm. publishing, which again can be read by either only scientists, but likely also journalists and policymakers and others. And yeah, so I think this is also like I said, there's so many things that we also as access to perspectives try to cover which are not well taught to academics yeah. early in their career or even undergraduates i think should get some insight into all of these aspects in order to then not to um yeah or in order to have a better experience during their phd and postdoc time <laughs> yeah exactly um, and also like when you when you then change industry um yeah it's really valuable to have a little bit of an experience uh within one of those uh fields that uh, possibly you didn't really get uh, through your phd so yeah it's important to really get um you know jump on different courses and different things that you know can enrich you as a as a professional mm -hmm. uh, also while you're doing your phd just basically getting out of the comfort zone that's that's something that i always uh, tell myself as well uh, because you get very lazy in your comfort zone, like especially during your PhD, you're just hanging out with your colleagues, your lab mates, most likely. Yeah. Uh, you don't really get to meet meet new, new people. You don't get, really get to interact with new people. While in uh, in consulting, for instance, it's all about you know, uh, kind of um, you know, meeting new people, talking to new people, and you need to be comfortable doing that. So that's something that I also wish I knew a little bit more in advance. Can I, can I ask you again because you spent time in New York City? Yeah. Um and like seven or so years ago, I was working for a life science startup and was in New York to meet the tech industry people. So um which I wouldn't have met well, basically at the time this is when when like now Berlin is also like in a life science startup heaven in Germany. New York had just started to become one after Boston. So the question is, doing your PhD, as you were in New York City, were you aware that just like, I think two and a half hours or so away, like Boston was, is still today, like uh, like the metropoli, metropoli for, for life science industries or 
um, not to mention that New York was at the time also emerging to become one. So, mm -hmm. so, so basically what I heard from you, you had no exposure to other sectors that might be relevant to your career. So no, I was starting to get a little bit of a, of an understanding of that. And uh, mm -hmm. shortly, like through these uh, uni courses and uh, and uh, some of these online, online events and in-person events, you get it a bit of a exposure to what's out there. But I think generally speaking, that didn't really give me a lot of insights into the job roles I could yeah. apply for, for instance. So, you know, I knew that what a research scientist does because that's what I was doing, okay? Mm -hmm. But if you ask me like regulatory affairs or if you ask me like anything about scientific, science communication and scientific writing, I, I wouldn't really know much about it. And I think that that was generally speaking, like to, to really summarize a little bit my experience and, and you know, also the journey, the, the journey that took me here, uh, it's, I really wanted to provide again, some tools that could summarize a little bit and could, could shed light a little bit on what's out there for PhDs. Mm. And I think that, that was all, you know, the motivation for my first book, but I think the second book um, that just came out recently was more about hearing from people, like it, it was more like of a co-creation kind of work. So hearing from people that took this leap to industry, into medical writing, into VC capital, into mm -hmm. entrepreneurship or things like that, to really hear from them what's, you know, what's 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 all about, what's what's what what what's the day-to-day -day like, and really get some insights on the skills mm -hmm. they really had to develop along the way. So I think th this part was really important. And this part I think it was something that I was very much lacking uh, when I was exploring my my career perspectives in general yeah yeah let's talk about first of all what struck me is the title of your first book what's so fascinating about salmon's jumping leaping <laughs> why why did you choose that title for your book <laughs> i i was uh it, it was an interesting one because i uh, i was thinking about something like an animal that will that will leap um from from one place to the other and i was thinking oh. that salmon's are really leaping upstream the the river right so wow. it, okay i'm getting it, goosebumps that's true keep talking yeah it, it's it's true it's true yeah so and it's pretty and it's it's kind of an exhausting kind of process because they need to get upstream the leave the river to really uh be able to mate and uh so that's something that you know they're really motivated to get up there but it's so exhausting and they're so exhausted at, at some point if like not not everybody uh, everybody makes it mm. and uh once they get up there uh, I don't remember like they, they, they're really exhausted for like several weeks or something like this so it's like something Fair that's uh, I don't know it was it was something that for me like was resonating like also for PhDs really making this leap to industry that sounds sounded back in the day is really so daunting to me as well so something like full of efforts and really this this leaping upstream something a river in this case mm. You know that like yes. in Europe, there are so many rivers that cannot be leaped through by salmons anymore yeah. or other fish for that matter. Um, but yes. I feel like there's also renaturation projects going on. So I feel like your book is a renaturation project for <laughs> graduates to and postgraduates <laughs> to consider a career outside academia and to give them a guideline. Like, or you you lower the barrier, basically, mm -hmm. or you deconstruct the concrete barriers that exist. Exactly. Uh, so great analogy as well. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. So that that was the thinking behind it, and uh, for my second book, which is instead called Beyond Academia: mm -hmm. Stories and Strategies uh, uh, from PhDs that took the leap to industry, it's still like this this element of leap leaping somewhere. Uh, but I wanted to make sure this time that you know I wanted to really include stories from people, and that's something that took me a long time, like a couple of years, to be honest, <laughs> to really summarize all these interviews I had with people. But I think generally speaking, like hearing the stories and really like putting together a, a work that was much more co-created by others was, mm -hmm. it's going to be much more valuable for people to hear. And, um, you know, it's really, again, a, a guide that is helping others to to get an understanding of what's out there and really kind of translate their skills into something that is understandable outside mm -hmm. the upgrade tower. So 
and that was something again that I was I was an Indian back in the day. So like I, I would look back at myself and really, you know, uh trying to create a tool that would be useful for me and uh and for others uh, to this regards. Mm, that's beautiful. So how many interviews did you end up putting into your book? So more than 50 actually. Um <laughs> Yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot of talking. Uh, it's like but a wealth of information. Yes, yes. I started already. It was, it was. I think mid mid twenty twenty one. I believe. Yeah, mm -hmm. I started that to us. Uh, you know, collecting uh, people and journeys and things like that to really understand what the leap was about and how they made it and uh, if there any kind of advice themselves also to for others to really uh how to understand how to really ace this uh this leap to industry so i think that's that was a, that was a great idea i think and it's something that uh you know everybody's talking about this informational interviews which are extremely useful so i was basically running informational interviews for my readers in other words mm. cool and are they categorized by sector or by a particular topic so they're, they're basically, um, so there's, there's a chapter in which uh, I really go through 10 stories of PhDs that made the transition to the most crazy uh, kind of, um, you know, career trajectory. And it's not as crazy as it, as it sounds, but uh, some, some of them like studied as, uh, as neurobiologists, for instance, and went into VC capital funding so something that is like for me wow that's mm -hmm. like so diverse or like other people that went from uh, a psychology research that went into user experience um, research for like uh, meta labs for instance or other stories like that so that chapter is a little bit more like there's a bit of a narrative while the of course the rest of the book is a bit more uh, non-fiction and I divided the rest of the interviews in a way that uh, I, in one chapter, I really explore like 20 jobs for PhDs that are out there. And I basically like, let, let's let's talk about consulting or, or scientific writing or these things. And after this, I describe the job, uh, you know, description of the, the day, what the day to day is like. I really ask people that in, in those positions to tell me more. So, for mm -hmm. instance, you know, medical writing uh, or like a scientific editor for uh, cell or, or, or nature or things like that. So that's the way. I thought of putting together like the interviews and embed them in a way that you know it would make the reader a little bit more excited and go through a non-fictional book which is for some readers pretty uh tough at times mm -hmm. so it's not you know a, a, a bad time kind of read uh, approach uh, it's more like there's a there's a bunch of exercises at the beginning like to really understand your values and really understand what's next in your career there's some about uh, you know informational interviews CVs, resumes, as well as writing a cover letter, and then until you know negotiating uh, towards the end uh, your salary, your new offer, and really acing the first uh, you know uh, ninety days of in in the new industry. So it's a little bit of a journey that felt a little bit more complete than the first one, and like bringing these voices in from from people was just I think such an added value for me as well personally. Yeah, no, for sure. It's like. A... Yeah, but many people would put a fortune of their um money into. But it's a, it's a huge value. Yeah, hope so. I really <laughs> look forward to hear from people what they think about it. <laughs> All right. So um if there was one thing you would you would share with your your how did I say that my your past self? Like what yeah. what was what would be one or two things you would have told yourself as a PhD student in your second or third year um, that you know today? Mm, well, uh, uh, get yourself out book. there, first of all. <laughs> read, read my book, first of all. Uh, mm. Get yourself out there and get yourself out of your comfort zone. Really try to like get out of your bubble, get to know other people and get to know other other people and other alumni that um, that uh, took this leap to industry and really trying to understand what's out there for you and just don't don't stay in academia for so long. Uh, it just it, it just makes no sense if you if you if you know already because I knew already back in the days I wanted to go into I wanted to try uh, some uh, 
some uh, you know jobs in industry but um i just didn't like didn't have time or like the strength to gather um you know information about it and or uh, really start uh, this process so you know really get out of mm -hmm. the the ivory tower get out of the, your comfort zone and really try to explore what's out there for you and yeah. you know make choices accordingly what comes to mind is linkedin it's not that mm -hmm. Any of us or I'm getting paid for and um sharing the the brand name. But LinkedIn has a way of checking and building a network first, but then also checking um for institutional profiles like uh, like your college and the Cornell University in New York. Um and then check their the profile and then they have an alumni section on mm -hmm. LinkedIn where you can see what industries um, people who graduated from Cornell in a particular department or generally, what um, what companies hired them or where they ended exactly. up working or exactly. what sectors they ended up working. So that's a great way, an easy way to inform yourself or just use mm -hmm. whichever search engine you feel comfortable with. Like what's the uh, job opportunities outside academia in my research field? There's mm -hmm. a wealth of information also on that. And again, your book. <laughs> I'm also talking to the non-life scientists here. So whichever right. discipline you're studying. Also, mm -hmm. we should mention that um like the the what is it, the tenure track only has position for I think the numbers range some, some like anywhere around 0.4% of mm -hmm. the PhD students who currently graduate will have a position within academia. Mm -hmm. so that's uh that's a reality that which is also obviously not sustainable <laughs> yeah like you you're most whoever is listening and you're currently in academia you're most likely not to stay in academia anyway so it's mm -hmm. it's you might as well check now where would like to find yourself in two or three years time or exactly. next year already <laughs> and there's plenty of exciting jobs out there <laughs> mm -hmm. <Believe laughs> and it or not. like us you can teach researchers you can stay in the realms of academia academia is also in the process of reinventing itself with all the stakeholders towards more also and then needs services like ours and industry services to keep the academic system running and to rebalancing it to mm -hmm. to to a more yeah enjoyable um workplace for everyone to to be mm -hmm. in Sure. right so exciting times um we're in the middle of a transformation <laughs> and thank you so much for the time spent with us and um yeah and and everyone we you will find Mateo's details in the show notes there's a blog post that we share on our website um you can of course listen to the recording again um <laughs> and buy or check out his books where can people find your book on amazon I'll provide the link. Yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah. Um. And then speak to you soon, and hopefully see you soon again, maybe in another um format. And yeah. but thanks for joining us today. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. For thanks for having me. My pleasure. All right. <laughs>